What inspired me to do Change Festival was this idea that if I told stories, it would galvanise people into action. There's a lot of questions and, and there's a lot of uncertainty in what we face, but what's going to get us through is our relationships with others and our ability to trust each other and to work alongside each other. Our ability to face these challenges together is what is going to give us the resilience and the capabilities to get through the hard times which are coming. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us. We have now begun our latest learning journey, or perhaps it's better to call it an unlearning journey, from me to we. You are still welcome to join us or to join for the speaker sessions that you are most interested in. Next week, the theme is The Expanded We, and our speakers are Charles Eisenstein, Jyoti, and Reverend Jen Bailey. I feel this is going to be a really inspiring conversation. We'll be exploring the questions, what happens when we move beyond polarity and anthropocentrism into a larger sense of we? How do we embrace both the more than human world and those who have different beliefs to us in our understanding of who we are? We have also launched our new membership. And so if you head over to our website and click on support, you will find a link to our new membership offering and details about the app that we have created. You'll be able to join and we've also now got it so that it will change into your local currency and you can join in your own currency, either as a monthly or an annual membership and then really become part of this community, which is really when the magic happens. This week's episode is a really special one as it's with a wonderful woman who was a listener of this podcast and then a patron and then a collaborator. And for me, this embodies what all that we are is here for, to bring us together, to create change and explore together, to create community and inspiration so that we can make new friends, so that we can uplift each other, and through that, co-create a more beautiful future. Our guest today is Becky Birchill, a futures producer working at the intersection of the arts, communities, and the environment. She is currently co-creating a new community-owned food hub in her village in Dorset to include an agroecological mixed farm, new premises for their much-loved village shop, and a new cafe. Becky is also the founder of Change Festival, a multi-arts event that invites audiences to imagine a better future. Previous the arts curator for two of the UK's most successful festivals, Festival and Camp Festival, Becky came up with the idea for Change Festival after she had her daughter in 2015. She launched the first iteration in October 2019 at Warwick's Arts Centre in Coventry. More than a thousand people attended with over 20 events, including the sellout theatre show, The World We Made, which Becky envisioned and produced based on environmentalist Jonathan Porritt's book of the same name. During COVID, Becky produced five short fictional films called Rise Up with the same creative team that made The World We Made, which were launched in partnership with charity Reboot the Future and aimed to inspire hope in young people. Change Festival took place for the second time in November 2021 as part of Coventry's City of Culture celebrations. And the lineup included musician Cosmo Sheldrake, Peace Pilgrim Satish Kumar, Orchestra for the Earth, and cabaret artist the Coco Butter Club, as well as discussions, workshops, family performances, and theatre shows. Becky says that creating Change Festival was like doing a PhD in the future. To curate the festival, she took a deep dive into the question, how can we imagine better? And her discoveries have led her to where she finds herself now, working creatively within her community and with the land, weaving in all the joy and possibility that her festival revealed to her. Working creatively within her community and with the land, weaving in all the joy and possibility that her festival revealed to her. I was actually imagining how amazing it would be if there was an accreditation for those of you that listen to this podcast and that dive deep into all of these themes, because it really does feel like a PhD sometimes, the bringing together and the exploration and asking these questions. Perhaps that's something for the future that we could connect with some universities with all the things that we're doing here. In this conversation entitled Resilient Communities of Hope, 
we explore the themes of the arts, storytelling and climate culture, where we speak to the question, how do we inspire and live the change? I hope that you enjoy this conversation and it inspires you to make the changes that you see are possible. Welcome to All That We Are, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between activism, the sacred, creativity, and regeneration. The spaces where our inner and outer worlds dance. From healing trauma to nature connection, to new technologies, to ancient wisdom, it's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a more beautiful future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to listen, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing and envisioning, we create the futures of our wildest dreams and we begin to embody all that we are all that we are becoming, and all that is possible. Becky, I am delighted to welcome you to All That We Are and to share this time together in a conversation that feels like it's been a very long time coming. Also just acknowledging that we're both sat here a bit covid in this moment. Um, and yet, as we're all learning to live with this pandemic in deeper and more present ways, more integrated ways that we can still be here and share. I would love for you to tell us what is the, the futures of your wildest dreams. What comes to you when you hear that question? Thank you, Amisha. It's a great question to start with. In my mind, when I think of the future of my wildest dreams, I think about the land. I think about the land here surrounding me where I live in Dorset. And I think about a huge abundance and diversity on that land. I think about food production. I think about orchards. I think about animals, wildlife, biodiversity. I think about water on the land. I think about resilience. And I think about looking out on a landscape that looks transformed to the one that we see now, which is in many ways a kind of green agricultural food desert. I think starting with where you live, where your place is, where your home is, is a really amazing and powerful tool to, to think about the future and what it might look like. The future I see for the land here is, is a land that we don't see in this country at the moment. It's something that we, we don't experience. And so it's quite, a, it's quite a leap from where we are now. And yeah, the word that keeps coming up for me is this diversity, diversity of wildlife, diversity of people, diversity of food. And with that diversity brings a resilience which is something that we will need in spades for the future. I guess because I'm from an arts background as well, I can't help but imagine the people and the celebrations and all of the parties and all of the gatherings that happen on that land in all different places than they happen at the moment. We're so used to the countryside being centred around villages and towns and we forget that we have this whole other world available to us that at the moment we don't have access to. So I really imagine a freedom for us to explore and enjoy our lives in a much, much bigger space and playground than we currently have. And with that, I imagine our lives to be much richer and again, more diverse in the things that we do in our everyday lives. And I think about what benefits that would bring us for our mental health, what benefits that would bring us for our connections with each other, Again, this word diversity, when we sort of have an abundance and we have this life which has many different aspects to it and many different places to go and many different people to come across, I think that's the kind of life where we'd feel a lot more fulfilled and some of the issues that we know are holding us back at the moment that are causing a lot of problems in the world at the moment perhaps would be 
forgotten <laughs> or we will have left them behind. So you mentioned the village where you live in Dorset and it's a quite a unique situation that you're in and not, not one that I've heard of in any other any other examples. Can you tell us about Chettle and how you came to live there? What makes it different and the vision that you're holding together as a community? Yeah, it is it's a very unusual situation. I became introduced to Chettle about 12 years ago through a good friend of mine who's now become a very close friend called Alice Favre, who at the time, her mum owned the entire village and the 900 acres that surrounded it. And it was very unusual because it was run really with like not-for-profit principles. And unlike a lot of other estates in the country, pretty much every other estate I know, the money from the rents and the land rent were just put back into the community. And there wasn't anyone taking out profits and and going and living in in rich, absent places. Alice's mum, Susan, was the second generation woman. So it's it's her mum, Esther, ran the village before her. And Alice's mum sadly died in 2017 and Alice inherited the village. And we moved here in 2018 to join Alice on that journey. And since we've lived here and since Alice has been in charge, there's been a process of thinking about the future of Chettle. It's come at a time when we know we're going to have to change because of climate change. We have to rethink the way we live our lives. And if you own 900 acres of land and houses, there's a very pressing need to think about how they will cope in the future. And so there's been a big invitation to think about how the land may transition and the houses may transition to not only be less carbon intense and use less carbon, but also to prepare for what's to come. That process has been really amazing and I've been helping Alice on that imagination and it's been really informed by that the work that I do and it's really interesting because when you it's a small community there's only a hundred people that live here there's about 33 houses it's a real mix of people there's it's not an intentional community like somewhere like Findhorn it's just people from all walks of life the rents are really low they're they're 40 percent of market value on average and so people have lived here for a really long time and so when thinking about what might come in the future, we're working with a really interesting and diverse community here who not everybody is concerned about climate change. Some people are really passionate about local or really passionate about food, but perhaps haven't until maybe recently thought about the the challenges that might come up in the future with climate change. So we're going on a really interesting journey where on the one hand, there's like lots of big thinking happening about the long term plans of the estate. And on the other hand, there's lots of things happening with and amongst the community to think about, you know, what we can do here and now, tomorrow, next week, next year to prepare for that. So we've got a lot of tree planting going on. We're reinstating some of our orchards at the moment. We've just embarked on quite an ambitious project, which project manager on to launch a new community food hub, which will be taking community ownership of our wonderful village shop here and adding on a cafe and really excitingly a small mixed agroecological farm as well, all of which will be community owned. And the plan for that is that we'll be converting some barns in the village, which will be rented on a really long term lease. So we're really playing with this idea of not only are have the community been benefiting from this model of this kind of non-profit model for a long time, but now it's being flipped so that this project is the first one where the community and any members of the community are being invited to be involved in actually leading on this and shaping the project. So we're in a big experiment, really. (laughs) And we can do this experiment because of the unusual situation of the village. And we appreciate that not everyone will be in a position to do the same things. But at the same time, a lot of us here have a shared feeling of a responsibility to try out some of the things that maybe we can do faster than other people because the land and the houses are all under the same ownership. So whereas in another village, you might have a bit of a longer journey to try and make change or find somewhere to plant trees or reinstate the village orchard, those kind of things we can do quite quickly. So there's a lot happening. Yeah, it's a really interesting and exciting journey, but I I wouldn't have been able to do it without the work I've been doing with Change Festival, which is obviously how we met and thinking about, you know, all the different ideas and people and inspiration that's come from places like, you know, the podcast and all the amazing people you've interviewed. When I was reflecting on coming to talk to you today, I was just thinking about how many 
of the amazing people that you've interviewed whose ethos has influenced what we're doing here in the village. I think of people like Lila Jean and her amazing vision about, you know, Indigenous land management. And Helena Northberg hodge is someone that we've met and has been a huge inspiration to us. I've worked with Jonathan Porritt now and, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on. So, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for that as well. Oh, it's my pleasure to imagine that something from these conversations actually becomes something real and tangible. That's why we do it. I know that's why you do it. It's not about ideas. It's about opening up like what is possible and different ways of understanding where we are and where we could be. The, when we spend time with these different perspectives, then we kind of can reimagine. And, and in your case, you are actually creating something different in a community that has a very tangible and real impact on people's lives. And it's incredible that Alice is choosing to do this as well, because there is a, an aspect of it that's like, it's an unusual situation, but it's, it's an unusual situation because she has chosen to create that situation. Her mother chose that situation. Uh, her grandmother chose that situation. And in this country, the way that things are with equality and land ownership, that is a very unusual thing because that's not the normal way of wealth distribution. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's interesting to think about the very simple facts of why the rents are so cheap here, because the rents are so cheap is because Alice's family have owned this village since 18. 46 or some somewhere in the 1800s they bought it outright and they own the whole village and since then it hasn't changed hands so no one has has profited in the sale which is what usually happens with houses you know a bank hasn't profited no lender has has profited from the houses changing hands and therefore the houses are all owned outright the land is all owned outright so there's no interest being paid and so that saving gets passed down to the people that live here. The village won't be sold because it's locked into a, a kind of a trust. It's, called, it's a heritage village, which is sort of locked in. And so it just makes you realise, like, if we all have models in villages or in towns where the ownership was static and people were able to have a stake in it on a long-term basis without the banks making money every time and without the house prices being inflated every time there was a sale, that would be in a completely different position and people would have really, really different quality of life. And it's so, like you said, it's so against the grain. And when you talk to other estate owners, the first thing they always say is you should put the rents up. Why don't you put the rents up? They should be at market value. And by not doing it, it's a massively disruptive and quite confronting challenge to what is seen as the, the norm. But, you know, I'm sure like you, Misha, we come across a lot of people in this space that talk about being disruptive and talk about challenging things and being radical. But when it comes to the money side of things, they're not prepared to do things differently. They still have to make it make sense within the capitalist model. And I think that's where there's a bravery that's happening here in this village by Alice and by her mum and by Esther before her, where they I don't think Alice's mum or Esther would have thought that they would have classed themselves as radicals in that way, but they were doing something that was different from other places in many ways. And I think that's where, you know, that's exactly like you talk about the podcast. We have to see these examples and we have to hear about these stories in order to inspire other people. I think a lot of people that live here that have enjoyed the cheaper rents for a long time, you know, there's a lot of families that wouldn't have been able to afford to live in a village like this. You know, it's a very sweet, picture perfect Dorset village. And if you go to the next village along or any villages within a five mile radius of us, the house prices are astronomical and there's hardly anywhere to rent. And so as a result, we do have a much more mixed and also younger demographic in the village, more young families rather than these kind of sleepy villages with lots of retired people or second homes. So socially, we're in a really different position as a result of the model of it as well. Yeah, it makes me contemplate, you know, the classic phrase that like we have enough for everyone's needs, but not everyone's greed. And I feel like we all perhaps experience it in different ways because we've been trained to be capitalists. And so it's like, oh, but you could get that. So to be able to say, but 
I could, but I'm not going to because actually this is enough. And by not doing that, by not putting the rents up, I'm actually enabling a different quality of life. And the housing crisis in the UK is is very apparent at the moment. Like it's very, very hard to rent places. It's very, very hard to buy places. Places are just getting like snapped up in lots of areas before they even go on the market. I know a lot of people looking for somewhere to live and it's like the estate agent said, you know, we have 400 inquiries the minute that that property went up for rent. And, you know, it's really hard. And part of that is because of Airbnb and because of properties having like they have that value. It's like, well, a family could live here and raise their family and this could and contribute to the community and bring all kinds of value that is social, that will have a legacy in this place. Or, yeah, or you could just rent it by the night and then you make six times more. So that's better. And it's like, how do we undo that way of thinking? Because I'm sure we all meet it in different parts of ourselves because it is the system in which we've been trained to live in. Yeah, I mean, I would say speaking personally about living here and being able to live here has enabled me to work on change festival which was the festival that i that i started and i launched and obviously like anything that you launch yourself especially in the arts you know that it's not it's not well paid and you're you're fundraising for it if i was to live in this equivalent house in another village and have to buy it and pay a mortgage for it or have to pay the full rent i wouldn't have been able to give as much time as I did, I would have had to have earned more money in order to contribute to our family income. Obviously, I'm in a, I'm in a lucky position that my husband works as well. And so obviously, we've got, you know, potentially two incomes coming in. But because the rent is low, it's enabled me to give something else back that I wouldn't have otherwise done. And um, there was a really amazing artist who lived in the village who died a couple of years ago called Peter Rush, beautiful man and incredible artist. And he always said the same. He said that Chettle had enabled him to be able to be an artist. And it's just such an amazing sentiment to to realise that, you know, when you're not up against the rat race all the time and when you're not being pushed to 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 essentially mainly like lie in the bank's pockets that's what we're doing every time that's what the housing market is doing if you think about most houses it's 50 to 100 percent interest going to the bank over the lifetime of that debt you know the only people benefiting that are the banks the people aren't benefiting from this so we have to really rethink these models and, and when i moved to chettle it that that wasn't on the radar of one of the the radical things about it in terms of that that real disruption of the the financial system but actually it really is and and I guess that's what I find so interesting about living here is it shows that other ways are possible so you mentioned change festival and I remember us going for a walk many years ago talking about getting involved in change festival and then of course this last one that was happening during COP26 was just such an incredible event that you put together with so much inspiration and laughter and music and dancing and performance and just a whole kind of visceral experience to make us reconsider and make us kind of re-understand ourselves in a different way. Can you share the inspiration for Change Festival, where it came from in you? And yeah, what that process has been for you to create something like that. Yeah, so around the end of the, of the probably 2008, I started working for Bestival and Camp Bestival as the arts curator. So I was booking all of the arts performance for both festivals. And for those who don't live in the UK, they're too really successful, well-known like music and arts festivals, really colourful, really creative, amazing music, but also performance, really amazing decor. Festival sadly no longer is is going, but Camp Festival is still going strong. So I worked with them for about seven years. And during that time, I was booking cabaret shows, theatre shows, discussions. Uh, I booked a circus that performs from a crane, some really weird and wonderful theatre performances that sort of accosted you in the woodlands late at night, children's shows, a huge carnival parade, everything you can imagine that the arts could offer 
was crammed into one of those festivals. And because I was working across both of them, festival was more for the adult, young adult audience and camp festival was more for family audience. I got exposed to a huge amount of arts in the UK across lots of different sectors, even, you know, everything from from the spoken word right down to who's who's got a book out this year that we want to promote. So there was some incredible people that I met on that journey. And obviously working in festivals before I had a family myself was was really an amazing dream job. But when I had my daughter in 2015, I always thought I would go back knowing that it would be a bit full on, but I, I I sort of loved that job and wanted to go back. But after she was born, I was sat breastfeeding for hours on the sofa and reading a lot of The Guardian online. And it was the year when, I've forgotten his surname, but that the editor at the time, Alan, his first name was, was about to retire. And it was his kind of final swan song to promote everything that he could about climate change, promotes not the right word, to inform his readership as much as he could about climate change. And it worked. I mean, I would always think one day I'll probably write to him and say thank you for opening my eyes in a way that hadn't been opened before. It was like a, a sort of waterfall of information about the state of the world that we're in and how urgent it is that we do something about it. And I wouldn't say I was uninformed before. I, I grew up actually in a life that was very connected to nature. And so I've always been, there's always been elements of me that has been that have been an environmentalist since I was a kid. But climate change and the kind of focus and the urgency wasn't something I was really awoken to until, until that moment. And then I read Naomi Klein's book, this changes everything and then that there was no going back after that so you can imagine I had like a three month old baby um in my arms and her book in another and I couldn't go back to best of all after that I felt that I had to do something I had to use the experience I had to try and respond to what I saw was the biggest issue of our time because I'd been a festival curator before, obviously the first thing that came to mind was I'm going to create a festival about this. In the beginning, I wanted it to be, I guess, an informative festival that would tell everybody what I'd heard, but in stories and through the arts um, with speakers and with theatre shows and with spoken word and with performance. But then as I carried on researching about this issue and thinking about how I would curate it, what would be the framing of it, what would be the kind of invitation to the audience, I realised that there was all these incredible stories out there of people that were actually not only way ahead of me in terms of understanding and knowing that climate change and and not just that but you know environmental breakdown was really serious and imminent they were way ahead of me in terms of thinking about solutions to that and responding to that and looking at the world very differently as a result of that so I went on this quite crazy journey where I started looking for the stories that would create a festival where we could collectively imagine a better future. And that ended up being the framing for the first festival in 2019. How do we imagine a better future? So I went out there to try and find the the art work, the art performances that would tell that story. And that's what led me to the podcast. It's what led me to many, many more books, many, many, many newsletters, many websites, many people, many conversations. I mentioned Jonathan Porrett earlier on, and he was someone that I turned to quite early on, actually. And he very generously gave me quite a lot of his time. And I ended up producing a play from his book called The World We Made, which imagines what the world might be like in 2050 if we pulled our socks up and got on with making the changes that we need to do to solve climate change. So he he wrote this book, which was this incredible vision of what that future could be. I worked with him and an amazing playwright called Beth Flintoff and a brilliant director friend of mine called Sophie Austin. And we created a play that also was part of the first change festival. What I found was, which was really interesting when I had this framing about how do we imagine a better future, was I could see all these incredible stories out there. I could see that there was this indigenous wisdom. I could see there was people doing things in communities. I could see there was people doing things with food. 
And I really started to understand that it wasn't just about the things people were doing, the actions they were taking. It was about seeing the world differently and starting to unpick all of the stories that we have always been told we've been telling ourselves or that we've been taught we touched on capitalism earlier and we touched on this idea of you always have to make the biggest profit that you possibly can and wouldn't it be ridiculous to not do that but there's so many examples of that which of course you know you've covered in your podcast at great length but even the simple thing that humans are part of nature and not separate from nature the idea that we might you know, as a society, be more collaborative than we might be competitive. You know, all of these narratives that we've told ourselves, which are perpetuating the climate emergency and the environmental issues which we're facing. So my challenge was then to find the artwork out there that would that I felt would hold these stories in the way that I saw them. And what I found was the arts has been, I would say, quite slow to respond on a big scale to these issues. Like many sectors, it's not, it's not the only sector. I found that there were works out there, there was maybe a theatre show out there that might be dealing with ocean plastic, but it was quite like didactic, it was quite informative. There's lots of ocean plastic out there and we need to do something about it. Or I might find a beautiful mu music orchestral show that would be about the coral reefs dying, but it would be so opaque and quite hard to get to the heart of about, you know, I listen to this and I see this, but but now what, what do I do with this information? I guess what I found was missing were these kind of hopeful stories, these inspirational stories that I felt would really hold this question of how do we imagine a better future? So 2019 Festival, in the end, I, I was really proud of it and I was really proud of the of the curation and, and the people that were part of it. And I think in the end, I did find some really incredible people to hold some of that narrative. It was hard work because I think climate change and this moment that we're in is such a big topic. It's sometimes very hard to distill down to an hour story. <laughs> it's sometimes hard to capture um, in a comedy show in a way that feels like it really speaks to, to some of these issues. One of the things that it kind of led me to as Change Festival was continue to try and seek out these conversations with artists and with arts institutions about climate change and about how they respond to it. And what I realised, you know, after I did the first Change Festival, when I got sort of invited to talk to different organisations and talk to young producers, where I realised people were going wrong in the arts was that they were starting with the what I call the stage. They were starting with the nuts and bolts of how you create a work of art or how you create a theatre show. So they were saying, OK, we're going to make a theatre show. We want it to be environmentally friendly. So we'll try and do it without travel or we'll try and do it without buying things or we'll try and turn off all the lights in our theatre. The thing I always said to these to, to these organisations was, your product is the story. That's your business. This is what we do in the arts. Our product is the story. So we need to let the lighting companies worry about the lights. They can mend the lights and make them really, really efficient. And we need to let, you know, like the transport companies worry about the transport. Like our job, if we've got one thing to worry about, is telling different stories about this moment and the stories that are really going to inspire people. And there are people out there doing it and it is happening and it is changing. And some really interesting organisations like Culture Declares, who are really galvanising the arts sector and Music Declares as well, and really helping people feel into this. The challenge within the arts is to not dip into dystopia. It's a challenge, you know, it's just a general challenge of like, it's always easier to tell a tragedy than it is to tell a comedy or a, or a, or a positive story. You know, it's not to say... You always have to tell stories with happy endings, but it would be depressing if all of our arts was only holding the kind of black mirror type <laughs> stories of the end of the world. Or even, you know, stories like Don't Look Up, which I think is an absolutely fantastic film and a really, really brilliant, funny offering to this space. But, you know, it doesn't have a good ending. <laughs> so... Yeah, I, 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 I think for the 2021 festival, which you were brilliantly part of, it felt like there was holding more of the stories I wanted to tell. But I still think that arts generally has 
a big challenge ahead and also an amazing opportunity to really do something incredible in terms of the power that it holds to change hearts and minds through the stories it tells. Thank you. I want to just go back to the festival for a minute and just say <laughs> thank you for what you did there because I went to several festivals in my 20s. It was always my favourite adventure down to the Isle of Wight and it was the, always like the most memorable experience of the summer and I feel like that commitment to the unexpected and to the arts and the, and the extra kind of visual and, and visceral kind of experiences is what made that different so yeah thank you for the the work that you put into that because I'm sure that that influenced you know this and everything there and also I have would like to just share that the Guardian editor that you mentioned is Alan Rusbridger for those around the world the Guardian is kind of the most sort of independent media that we have left <laughs> in the UK and that he was editor from 1995 to 2015. So a big chunk of that legacy. And now The Guardian is one of the only media outlets that really covers this stuff in a way where we can actually kind of understand what's happening with climate and have some of those perspectives and narratives kind of challenged of it's somehow all right, even though it's happening. That space that we have to kind of live in where in our everyday lives it's like but you just need to keep making a living and keep doing what you're doing and you know crack on and it's somehow going to be okay and yet when you actually read into the climate science and you see what's happening and if you've been part of this I was going to say this world like this whole world <laughs> but if you've been paying attention to climate it's been a real journey over these years to comprehend and to hold that schism that exists. The arts is such a powerful way of us being able to interact with it in a different way, where, you know, it kind of can catch us a bit off guard. And then we can kind of find ourselves playing something back the next day or three days later and being like, oh, hang on. <laughs> like, what does that mean? <laughs> or like, what is happening? Or how can I change my life to having now just got a glimpse of maybe what another human being's experience is, or of what might be possible? I wonder if you could share with us what some of your favorite pieces that you've had in Change Festival are and, and why you think they've been powerful. Yeah, so we had a really wonderful play this year called Nevergreen, which told the life of Rachel Carson. Um, for those who don't know, she wrote the book Silent Spring, which was about pesticide use, particularly DDT. What's so interesting about her story and why it's, it's so, such a beautiful play and, and in many ways inspiring, even though it's a sad story, was because she was such a reluctant activist. I say reluctant, maybe that's not the right word. She didn't set out to be an activist and in some way she did resist it, but something called her and she was the right person to tell that story. She was a, an incredible nature writer in the 50s, really um, wrote absolute beautiful, almost poetic stories about the natural world. I think she'd written two or three books before she was commissioned to write Silent Spring, but she was she was intending to write a different book, which was about the ocean and about the edge. She, I think she was talking about the edge of the beach between the beach and the ocean. And she had all these amazing ideas of how she would bring that to life. And in the course of her writing that book, she was getting all these letters because she was well known as a nature writer about birds dying and the, and the really horrific damage that chemicals were doing at that time in America to completely obliterate the wildlife completely. And that's why it's called Silent Spring, because there was literally one spring where everything was dying. So the book she wrote came from a kind of nature writer's perspective. It wasn't an activist book in a way. It wasn't even like an environmentalist book. It was a nature book about the harm that this was doing to nature. And she had a beautiful way of writing. And she died not long after she wrote it. But before she died, she was vilified and she received all sorts of awful sexism and trying to bring down her character and just saying that she, you know, she wasn't qualified to write what she wrote. And you can imagine all the tricks in the book from the chemical companies trying to bring her down. But what this play showed, which you wouldn't have imagined if you've just read the book, 
on its own was this this absolutely joyful woman that just loved nature so much. And I know that you've spoken to a lot of people on this podcast, Amisha, that feel that they get called to something at a certain time. I remember Polly Higgins's interview so beautifully about the moment that she she felt called to do the work she was doing with Ecoside. And I think Rachel Carson's story is similar. She couldn't not tell this story. She was the one chosen to tell the story. And as a result, there were changes, big changes. DDT got banned. And not just that, when you speak to most environmentalists now that have been in this game for a long time, she was the book they read. You know, it was her book that really like changed them. And and so, you know, it's not a fictional book, but the way it was written touched people in a way that fiction often does or beautiful writing often does. I loved that play. And we had that this year at Change Festival. And it was created by a, a, a very a young, completely new theatre company called The Wonderful. And they did it absolute justice. They did it so beautifully. They're going to do really well with that play. So we were totally honoured to to have almost the first performance of that at Change Festival. So that was one of my favourites. In the first festival, as I mentioned before, we worked with Jonathan Porritt on his book, The World We Made, which... Although I produced, I will give massive credit to the scriptwriter and the director, Sophie and Beth, who who really brought it to life. The wonderful thing about that play was that we staged it to have actually no stage. So the audience were like looking in on the characters and it was played by two, two young people who played all of the characters throughout the play. And it was a kind of whiz through time, like whiz through 50 years of all the different things that happened, but seen through the eyes of, of different characters. And so the audience were almost like on top of the performance. They were right there with the performance all the way through. And what was so beautiful about that was that once the play had finished and we touched on so many issues, we talked about the end of oil. We had a character who was Wangari, based on Wangari Matai. We talked about renewable energy. Uh, we talked about flooding. We've covered the tar sands in Alberta. We had all these things covered, but in a really human, beautiful, accessible way that ultimately ended up feeling like a hopeful piece the audience were invited to have a discussion about it. And because they were already kind of right in the play and talking, you know, almost facing each other. So when the lights get went on at the end, the discussion that happened afterwards was as much part of the performance as the performance itself. We had some really interesting conversations there, particularly kind of cross-generational, because the play featured young characters. Um, we had a lot of people that came, you know, with their children, with their teenage children, or we had some quite older people there. So we had these really interesting chats where they were able to discuss what they'd seen in the play and some of the things that had come up for them it gave a platform where it wasn't they weren't having to like disagree with each other they kind of had something to talk about so it, it really invited like a different quality of conversation about some really tricky issues one of the issues in particular that I remember was at the end of the play one of the young characters gets really cross with the older generations for not doing enough. You know, she's kind of already set in the future and she really loses her temper and shouts at everybody and, and actually shouts at the audience for not doing enough. It's kind of like a weird time travel thing where she's like, you know, it's your fault. And it's intentionally supposed to be quite a confronting moment. And, it, you know, you kind of come down from that and there's a bit of a surprise factor that comes into that. But for most people, it's quite a shocking part of the play. And that brought up some really interesting conversations with some students that were in their 20s and some of the older people that were there about this idea of blame and intergenerational responsibility. And obviously the, the feeling along, among a lot of young people that the older generations haven't done enough, but then also having been able to hear back from those older generations about how they felt about that was just, yeah, we, I, I think it would have been hard to orchestrate that kind of discussion without having that linchpin of the performance that, that enabled it. Yeah, like it opened the door for that to come out and to people feel to safe to kind of discuss it in a way that would have been really strange if you just put that out there and tried to get people to share. Exactly. Yeah. Can you share more about the process for you around how you've taken all of this information that you've read? You mentioned the Guardian articles and Amy Klein and and then every all the podcasts that you've listened to and all of the people that you've engaged with for creating Change Festival, how you've actually been able to take all of that and distill it into practice 
in the way that you're doing at Chettle? Because I feel like that's one of the things that people find really difficult. And I know that a lot of our friends that listen to this show feel really moved and inspired by things that people are doing, by ideas, by books that are written. Um, They feel very stirred by what's happening with climate, yet still like can't quite work out like how to do something with that. Yeah, I feel like all the work I did with Change Festival and all the research and all the thinking, what inspired me to do Change Festival was this idea that if I told stories, it would galvanise people into action. My favourite phrase is, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. That is what happened to me through (laughs) going through this process was that it did galvanise me to do something really tangible. And the way that's manifested in Chettle in particular is through the food hub that I mentioned, this idea that if not me, then who, I guess? I'm leading now on a project that is way out of my comfort zone in many ways. But equally, when you start looking back at your past experience you realize that there's lots of tools under your belt that can help with unexpected and difficult situations and that actually nearly every job that we've ever done we didn't know how to do until we did it so I definitely have that attitude that if you see something that you think needs to be done and no one else is stepping forward to make it happen that that's the first thing (laughs) is just put your hand Mm -hmm. up and, and say I can try and help with this In the Food Hub in particular, this idea of community ownership suddenly opens up a whole new possibility because not only are you kind of modelling something which really is challenging a lot of the stories that are fundamentally at the heart of why we have screwed up this world so much, which is about capitalism and greed and power structures. So automatically by making something community owned and democratised, you're already disrupting a lot of those stories that are at the heart of these problems so that I would say community ownership in itself if you can make things community owned whatever or can just try and and think about the power structures of wherever you are in the world that automatically is something that is that opens up a lot of other conversations and opportunities also I realized that food and land are really at the heart of of our lives, of all of our lives. There's something, there's so many amazing solutions around climate change and what we can do, but food and land are so central. You know, we need both. We need the land to nourish us, you know, for food, but also for our well-being. And so again, it seemed like those two aspects held a lot of the other changes that I felt I saw needed to happen. I felt that they could be held within food and land and how we produce our food. And then I guess the, the final part to that is is the community, the actual community itself, not the not the notion of community ownership, but community. When I was researching for Change Festival, community as as a solution, you know, how do we solve this? Oh, we, you know, build better communities came up so many times. You know, I was hugely inspired by the transition town movement. And before I moved to Dorset, I was I lived in Crystal Palace where there's a really active transition town there. And I have to credit them with opening my eyes and supporting me and give me loads of hope and positive examples of brilliant projects such as the amazing local market that they set up there where all of the food comes within 30 miles of the market and also lots of other incredible projects like helping to push community energy they've got an amazing cycling group they've got community gardens and Those kind of projects, you know, this idea that community has an ability to build its own solutions gets talked about a lot, but it actually really is happening. And when you see it happening well, it's so inspiring and it's so galvanising. And obviously here in Chessel, we have this small community who in many ways are already doing a lot, but in many other ways, there's still a long journey to go in terms of some people who live here who don't get involved, who we don't see, who we don't know and who aren't an active part of things. So for me, there's also this huge piece, which brings me back to the arts about culture. Like how in all the projects that we do, are we creating a culture that invites inclusion and invites people in? And what I've seen since I've lived here in Chettle, it's that culture is kind of messy 
and wonderful and make it up as you go along and a little bit haphazard. And, you know, for some people that involves uh, going to the village shop every day and that's that's part of the village culture. We've reinstated things like wassailing, which is where you go and bless the orchards and, and drink lots of hot cider and, and have flaming torches. <laughs> it's a great way to get out in winter. But it reconnects you with this idea that the apple trees are about to burst into life in the depths of winter. This idea that life is just around the corner. And for some people, that's, you know, that's really galvanizing. But for others, they're like, I'm never going to come to that. For some people, it's a cake sale and it's, you know, in the village hall and we're fundraising for a defibrillator. And that's the culture. And for me, I think what I think is really important is that it doesn't really matter what we're doing. I think Alan Lane in one of the talks at Change Festival had this brilliant phrase, which I love when he was talking about the working men's club that he's taken over in Leeds. And he said, we've got a rule which says everyone's allowed to do what they want, but they're not allowed to stop anyone else doing what they want. <laughs> and I think that's just such a great sentiment for any kind of mishmash of a community or any community, just to remind us that like being involved as long as it's not hurting anyone else and it's not stopping anyone else do what they want to do is welcome. And actually, the more you do kind of step into things and the more you do invite people into things, the more opportunities you create for doing the bigger, harder stuff together. What's always at the back of my mind and sometimes very much at the front of my mind is we know that we will face really hard times in this village, as will every town, village, city in this country. Like we know what's coming. It's going to be really hard at times, really, really tough. You know, when I walk the fields here, I think about where the flooding might come, what trees might fall down, you know, will the soil survive? Will all those tiny little oaks we planted last year, will they just get blown over next year? Will our amazing food hub farm that we're creating, will the polytunnels get blown away in the winters? There's a lot of questions and, and there's a lot of uncertainty in what we face, but what's going to get us through is our relationships with others and our ability to trust each other and to work alongside each other. We kind of need to do that work now. So it doesn't matter if the work is green work, <laughs> environmental work, it's great if it is, but if it's not, then that's okay too. I think our ability to face these challenges together is what is going to give us the resilience and the capabilities to get through the hard times which are coming. Thank you. What can you share about how we can better live in community or, or really be community minded? Because modern life is so not like that. What was kind of innate, like I remember in the 80s when I was a kid, like it was just kind of normal to like be very community based. And especially if you spent a lot of time in big cities, it, it kind of gets taken out of you a bit. And so how has that process been for you of Coming, say, from, from London, I mean, you were in a community in Crystal Palace, but actually learning to work in that way and make space for other people and deal with conflict and find, like, the path forward, you know, when you're making decisions. Like, what can you share about how do we rewire ourselves to operate in that way? When I moved to Chettle and I moved down from London, I definitely, you know, I, I know that there was those in the community that were very much, you know, moved down from London, kind of, you get the moved down from London label on you, you know, not not proper country folk and don't really know the ways of Dorset villages. And, and that's true, I didn't grow up in Dorset and I don't know the ways of Dorset villages, but where I did grow up for anyone that bothered to have the conversation was in a very, very rural valley on the edge of Exmoor. I grew up on a small holding there in a, you know, a really in a lifestyle that was very sort of back to nature. In many ways, was a lot, a lot more remote and a lot more sort of countryside than it is here. But as, as soon as you lived in London, you kind of you get a label. And, and you know, I'm also I'm, I'm hugely aware that for a lot of people in rural places, it's and in towns as well. You put people into boxes and you kind of say, I know that I know who you are. I know what you do. I know what sort of person you are. And we're all guilty of that. In terms of, of making it work in, in communities where you want to get more involved, you kind of have to just show up to, <laughs> to the things that aren't the things that you necessarily put the highest value on. You have to turn up and make the cake for the cake sale. You know, you might have to turn up to 
tend to the village green and, and do some weeding. The more that you show up for others, the more that they'll show up for you. That amazing artist that I mentioned, um, Peter Rush, when I first moved down to the village, he came over for dinner and he gave me this kind of like 10 commandments of community life. He just sort of reeled them off. It's not something that he said to everyone. He just had this kind of way about him where he'd, he'd share this incredible, incredible wisdom. And one of the things he said, which always stuck with me, was he said, people will, you know, be suspicious if you, when you move somewhere and you look different from them or you, you have a different lifestyle from them or you act different from them. But over time, they will accept you and trust you if they know that you you know, you've basically got their back, like you would be there for them in a crisis. If the push came to shove and you, you know, you drop everything and be there for them, then they will, they will accept all of that, all of that difference. And I think that's where in any community, that's what you kind of have to practice and enact and show. And I think COVID showed that for many people where people perhaps felt like they didn't have a community. And suddenly there was the person next door that was like, can I get you some shopping? And they said, oh, brilliant. And now I know I can rely on that person. If I need them, I can rely on them. And as soon as you know, you can call on someone and rely on them and they'll be there for you. It changes the nature of the relationship. But in order to do that, we have to show up for other people. And I guess that would be my my main thing that I've taken from living in this community is that we have to show up. And that's not to everything. Like I, I do draw a line, like I won't go to church because <laughs> I'm not religious. And I, actually, I it's not my, it's, I have been a few times and, I, and now I, I realise that's one place I don't want to step into with my full being. But I'm really happy to do fundraising for them. You know, if there's, a, if there's something where they need help or plants donated for a plant sale, like I'll do all of, all of that. I just don't want to be at the service. So there's ways we can do, we can do stuff across community that, that don't always involve finding our tribe, I guess. And that allow you to stay true to what's really important to you. So that there's that beautiful balance of being being you and also being part of the community. Yeah, and I think being you can sometimes feel hard when you feel like you're among people that don't get you or don't know you very well and how you get to know people. And it takes time. It takes time. And actually, it also, I think, takes maybe certain vulnerabilities as well. I think the people that I've realised that you end up getting close to in a, in a small community that end up being the unexpected people are where there's some vulnerability that you've shared or something that you know they're going through that you've you've stepped in to help with or equally that you've shared something from your own personal story that's been helpful for them you know we don't all have to be like closed off middle England people like I said I just keep going back to that thing of thinking well you know these might be the people that we're all bailing out water from our kitchens with so let's just you know <laughs> Let's like do the work now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have no idea what's really coming. I mean, we do, but we don't. Yeah, it's a really good time to get to know your neighbours and to really make friends. And I feel like COVID's been a really good invitation for that as well. It's been a real good invitation to tend to what's close and find ways of really relating and caring for each other because it's so easy to be busy right and all over the place and to not have time and what I'm really hearing about life in Chettle is it really invites you to be present and to have time and to make time and to step off that productive like and I don't mean productive like as in because obviously it is productive what you're all doing together in the in the community but that notion of like productivity in the capitalist format of like I have to do this thing for me so that I can pay this bill. Like that whole kind of narrative that can make people really not able to open their eyes. And we haven't even got into the whole phone part of it yet. <laughs> so there's that too. And so, yeah, how can we be more present to who is around us and what they might need? Yeah, and I think there's an element of like the sort of reciprocity as well, which, you know, I love the book braiding sweet grass and this idea that nature is this abundance and gives and gives and gives and I I definitely think that you know there's a culture which can be built within any community where whereby the more you give the more you receive that's certainly the case I think amongst you know we've now got some really really close friends here we genuinely do have a lot of our social life together because we are able to give each other a lot you know that we're really lucky in that regard but I think there's a sense of 
you know, in our, in our modern lives, we're often like, well, I need to compartmentalise all the different things. Like I need to go and get my respite and my kind of healing in this place. And then I need to spend some time going and getting fit in this place. And then I need to go and spend time with my friends in a pub in this place. And I guess what you get when you kind of are lucky enough to live somewhere like this, where we're all working really hard to offer each other as many of those things as we can. Yeah, we have a lot of time where some of those things overlap. So our run might be in nature. So we're having our nature time and we're having our fitness time and we're also catching up with our friends at the same time. So we're kind of efficient, I guess, is what I'd say, with our needs. I think that's something that we can all get wherever we live. And it's definitely something I started to get in Crystal Palace where it felt like going to the market, this amazing market, which was so beautifully curated as a transition town project, was meeting lots of my needs at the same time. So I was buying really amazing produce there I was also meeting new people there I was also learning a lot about the produce and how it was grown and seasonality you know I was also tasting all this new delicious food over the stool so it's about thinking how we stop compartmentalizing all the little bits of our life and try and weave them into something that doesn't feel so separate and so where there's so much conflict We are taking just a short pause here. If you are enjoying this episode, please consider joining our community. For a small contribution, you can be part of our beautiful online world where we deepen the conversation and offer spaces of learning and practice. As a member, you are a patron supporting the making of this show and you receive a number of benefits such as special member-only events, and discounts on all our courses, retreats, and in-person experiences. You will have membership to our app and connect with inspiring humans around the world through a social network to discuss the themes of the show away from the eyes of advertisers and the manipulation of big tech. Our membership is what makes us able to stay advertising free in a world that is always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. And it is the very heart of all that we are. Head to www.allthatweare.org forward slash support to find out more. Becky, at Change Festival 2021, which was during COP26, you curated this incredible set of discussions at Change Festival, uh, these Rise Up discussions. And I was lucky to be asked to come and host the conversations over the weekend. These conversations are now available to watch on videos. We've embedded the videos into the post that goes with this podcast so that everyone can watch them. And I thought it would be really nice for us to share the descriptions of those conversations and who's involved in them. And so maybe we can alternate and do one each, if you'd like to take one first. And why did you go with Rise Up? So Rise Up was inspired by some short films that I created actually during lockdown. When we did the first Change Festival and we created The World We Made, the play, it was supposed to be on tour during 2020. And obviously that didn't happen. So I worked with the same creative team, including Jonathan Porritt, to come up with these five short films that was this invitation for young people to think about how they could basically have hope in the face of not just climate change, but then COVID. So they were called the Rise Up Films. And as a result of that kind of process and that, and that research, it kind of led into thinking about how that would then, that fed into the idea for Change Festival. and. It was an invitation that had led on from Can You Imagine a Better Future, which was the first invitation of Change Festival. That was more about like, let's think about what it is we like and what we would like to see. And the Rise Up invitation was let's get on with it now. Let's actually, you know, this is more of we're moving into more of an active space. And that's also in response to how the world has moved in that time, which, you know, thinking about movements like Extinction Rebellion and the school strikes and just generally where everybody's head is at in terms of climate change has changed enormously. So this was more of an invitation to action to get on with it, roll our sleeves up. So I'll just read the first one, which was called Rise Up to Reimagine. When do we find time to dream? 
When do we really get the chance to flex our imagination and practice long-term thinking, to look into the future and imagine where we could go? Or to look into the past, to reconnect with what's been lost? When do we make space to reimagine ourselves and ways we could live differently? To move into new relations with those already around us or to those who may think differently from us? When does our imagination run wild to reimagine our environments, the places we live and the land that holds us? In this rich and creative discussion, we will hear from those who can help us reclaim our childlike sense of possibility and ground us in ways which we can practice imagination in our everyday lives. The speakers included Tom Ross Williams, Lorna Reese, Izzy McLeod, Cindy Ford, with Amisha Gadiali as host. What is the future that we choose? How can we create it? And how can we inspire each other to be living it? Because it's not something that we can do on our own. Everyone should be able to live a life that serves them and does serve humanity. Well, as an artist, I think it's your job and your responsibility to be imagining mm. things all the time. Start to give something in return, like a new form of not patriotism, not nationalism, but like stewardship of mm. this world. We're going to keep finding new identities. We're going to keep reimagining ourselves. And, and then that cultural shift has to happen through culture. It has to happen through art, through science, through spirit. And the next conversation was called Rise Up to Reconnect. We have long been championing a narrative of individualism, survival of the fittest, and every man for themselves. This illusion was shattered during COVID when it became clear that without all members of our society, the health workers, the growers, the shopkeepers, the delivery drivers, not to mention loved ones, we cannot survive. We are an interconnected ecosystem bound to a local and global community in infinite ways. Not only are we interconnected with each other, this is actually the secret to humans' rapid evolution. History shows us that it is our collaboration, not competition, that has been our greatest force. How can we now reconnect with each other in our community, across generations and across borders and ideologies to rise up to meet this moment together? And how can we reconnect with the natural world or to a greater web of consciousness to truly realize the power of unity? The speakers for this session were Kim Pullman, Alan Lane and Hannah Fitchett and me as host. Like if you're learning about something and that insight is useful, it should be presented in a way that anyone can understand and it should be used to help people. Um, but when you feel like you're part of a group of people, you're not the only one making those changes, you're adding those changes to this huge community. One of the principles that, that Indigenous people have uh, is about community, caring about their community more than their own ego. Empathy. I think that's the heart of all of this. Yeah. Empathy is imagination and action. We all want to be trusted. We all want to be respected. We all want to have dignified lives. We all appreciate generosity. We actually like to be generous. The next discussion was rise up to reclaim. Who owns the land? Who owns the rivers? Who owns the rocks? Humans have long laid claim to the parts of the natural world they can physically hoard, leading to wars, colonialism and capitalism. This has also resulted in us now living in the greatest time of inequality that civilization has ever encountered. Many studies have shown that we have enough resources to share equally between all humans, giving everybody a good standard of living. But how do we achieve that? How do we reclaim power and resources from the hands of the few to distribute it to all human and non-human creatures? How do we radically reinvent the concept of ownership within our homes, our workplaces, our communities and landscapes to ensure that every living being has equal access to all the incredible wonders that Earth has to offer? Speakers included Indra Adnams, Sam Lee, Anita Akundi and Radical Geographer Paul. We're waking up to how much they've been manipulated, forced to live lives that, that are not, not only good for the planet, they're not good for themselves, they're not good for their communities. We're living kind of wrong lives, in fact. So reclaiming time becomes one of the most important things. I don't think you can fix the old system. I think you have to build a new one that makes the old one obsolete. 
nuclear strikes are one of the biggest ways we see young people are hurt in terms of the climate movement. Always being questioning, so always being critical, never accepting the status quo. Making sure young people are part of the discussions, the global south, indigenous people, people of colour, making sure that these groups that are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis are here to speak at the table. Beat the opposition just to throw a better party. The final discussion was Rise Up to Reawaken. Why are we here? What does it mean to be alive together at this moment? And how can we be fully present to all that's being asked of us and offered to us? Not as a rational human, a faceless consumer, trained to generate wealth and productivity, but as essential, complex, feeling being who has a loving role in the rich ecosystem of Earth. In this discussion, we explore ways we can rise up to reawaken our understanding of our own presence, reawaken our bodies and our senses, reawaken our emotions and feelings that have been dulled and denied, and reawaken our intrinsic loving instincts. When we step aside from the cascade of news feeds, data and social media, we can learn to follow the patterns of nature, practice noticing more and deliberating less. We can begin to rest our nervous systems from the onslaught of modern life and find a different way of being in the world that gives us deeper meaning and contentment. How will this greater presence shift our perspective on our lives and our futures? And this discussion, the speakers were Tamsin Omond, Chris Salisbury and Zoe Palmer. The more that people share their experiences, the more it, it it reawakens the possibility inside those that hear them. There was this moment when, when different stories seemed to align and this kind of weaving of them created a huge and fierce fist that pushed climate and the ecological emergency into the mainstream. When do those movements tick through so that denial isn't any more an option? And we can find the beauty and the expansiveness and the depth of connection through being in very small urban areas. We can find a wildness and a power and a reconnection with our intuitive animal selves. We invite um, a kind of more soulful uh, conversation, finding your own path of particular service, which may not be hanging banners from Parliament Square. We can't afford a them and us. What do I do? Like, how can I be a participant? These conversations, it felt very profound that it was happening during COP26 and some of the speakers were like coming in or going out from COP and we were kind of in that background of knowing that that everyone was in Glasgow from all over the world having these discussions and out on the streets and that the discussions were soulful and hilarious at moments and really inspiring and that you curated a really really inspiring group of people for these conversations so I really do highly recommend to go and have a listen of those and so Becky how can people connect with you more if they would like to reach out to you <laughs> that's a good question I'm slightly off radar at the moment but <laughs> watch this space no if you'd like to connect with me my email is becky.birchall at gmail.com and otherwise i would highly recommend um yeah jumping on the change festival youtube channel and having a look at the discussions and if you want to know what we're doing in chettle we've also just got a chettle community youtube channel as well we, one of our wonderful newer members of the community has got some great film editing skills so she started making some really wonderful videos of what we're getting up to so Talking about great storytelling, that should give you a taste of where we're at at the moment. And there is a hotel in Chattel, so people can go and visit. <laughs> yes, good plug for the Castleman. There's a lovely hotel called the Castleman Hotel and Restaurant. So do check that out. And also our amazing village shop, which is called Chattel Village Store, which you can find on Facebook. And that is the shop that the community are soon to be buying to transition it into our very exciting food hub. So if you want to follow our shop journey, then you can follow them on social media as well. And I, I haven't been to the hotel, but I do happen to know that if you do stay there, that you can dive into my book, Intuition, that's on the bedstand, as well as Imaginal Cells, Visions of Transformation, which is a really inspiring book from Reboot the Future. 
and perhaps some others. So it's worth going just just for the reading, <laughs> the bedtime reading. And Helena Norberg Hodge's book, Local is Our Future, is also on the bedside table. Amazing. I love how you have replaced the place of the Holy Bible <laughs> with these three books. You can see that Alice and I muscled in on what we thought would be good to have on the bedside table. <laughs> Becky, thank you so much for your time. It's so wonderful to be with you and to share. And I look forward to collaborating in, in other ways in the future as, as may be. And yeah, thank you for your support with this podcast is really the people that became patrons, you know, in the early days and, and kind of got in touch and said, you know, thank you. This is helping in some way. This is doing something has really helped us to continue what we're doing on this side and and to grow what we're doing that part of it you know when somebody that's listening becomes what's now a member that really helps us in so many ways not just the financial part is for sure a big part of it but it's really the connection and it's knowing that you know we're in relationship with real human beings that are doing really beautiful things in the world or that are about to do really beautiful things in the world. And so, yeah, thank you for making that connection. Thank you. It's been really lovely to talk to you today, despite our slight COVID, COVIDness. I've forgotten all about it. So that's good. <laughs> we did well. Yes. Thank you for listening and spending your time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book and discover so much more over on allthatweare.org. We give space to our guests to share their perspective without debating it or fact-checking as this approach allows for deep, unedited conversations from the heart. We trust your discernment and wisdom to take what is useful and challenge what isn't in your own understanding. We offer spaces for discussion and integration in our membership community. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode and it has sparked some inspiration and creativity in you. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast. And so it's made possible by you, our beautiful community. If you loved this and would like to connect more deeply with us, please join our membership. For less than a tea or coffee a day, you can access our community conversations and benefits such as our app and member gatherings, as well as being a patron whose support makes this podcast happen. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen so others find us. All That We Are celebrates all that we are already and the untapped potential that lives inside us. It invites the full power of the more than human world, nature, the unseen, our ancestors and our future generations. It reminds us that we never exist in silo, through borders, timelines or polarity, that in each and every moment, all that we are is here.